we're going to look at Father Abraham a little bit, and, and we're going to see that as he breaks into this part of scriptural argument. This is my scriptural argument. Last week, last time, two weeks ago, was his personal argument for grace. The Bible teaches us, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could save yourself, then the Bible teaches us, even as the last verse of Galatians 2 tells us, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Then all the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection would be for nothing. The word vanity meaning, or the word vain meaning nothing. It would be absolutely useless. And we know it's exactly the opposite because the work, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the celebration of the resurrection that we had last Sunday reminds us that without, without that work, we are in a place where the law abiders would love for us to be. That's where we're going to go this morning, is really looking at how we are justified by faith and being reminded through, again, the account of Abraham in the Old Testament, hey, yeah, Abraham was made righteous by God for his belief, for his faith. Look up there on the screen very simply. You don't have to turn there unless you want to look at Hebrews 11. And if you are fast in your Bible, it's a good place to go. Then we'll come, of course, right back to our text in Galatians 3. But Hebrews 11 is called the uh, two different ways. Uh, I'll just incorporate them both. The hall of faith, the hall of fame, the hall of, hall of fame of faith of all these faithful men and women. And it says in verse number 6, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you then pick it up in, in verse number 8, 9, 10, 11 and go all the way down to 19, you see all of the account of the things that in Abraham's life happened by faith. By faith. Through faith, Sarah. His life was definitely a life lived by faith. So, when we push aside our faith walk, when we say, eh, God, I know faith's important, but, you know, I got saved, for by grace are you saved through faith, but now in my walk of faith, I struggle with it, and, and if I struggle, then I, I, mean, I don't know, how do I get back on track, or I, I get lost in some areas, and I, I don't know if God will take me back, or all those type of things in phraseology. When we push away our faith walk for a law-pleasing walk, what do we say to God? We say that you have not broken the chains away. As the word redemption means, a purchased slave that was set free. That is a redeemed person. And so you're saying, ah, I don't know, I'd like to go back into the bondage place. I'd like to go into the place of abiding by the law and living in, my play, in, my, in a place where I please God somehow by the law. And we're going to find out here in Paul's scriptural argument that this has been an attempt by man for centuries and it comes up short. In fact, and even thinking about that question, you might even just say this. I know you want me to earn favor, God. I mean, you got to. I mean, I, mean, I, I know this grace and faith thing was good, but that just saved me. And I would just submit to you, the people that are faithless, the law pleasers, they often walk away when they get tested and tried. I didn't say there were people that had no faith. I said faith less. They have less faith. They live in a place where, and, and we all have taken a shot at this, where we've allowed our faith to dry up. And then we're figuring, well, God, I don't know. Uh, I'm so sorry for all I did wrong, but I don't know how, I don't know. Would you, is your grace still available? Uh, uh, can I come back to you? Uh, <laughs> And the scriptures teach us very clearly, and Jesus Christ taught it even better than anyone, of course. When you look at the lost coin, the lost sheep, and of course, that lost son, the prodigal family. What about the faith of our father Abraham and how he pleased the Lord? What about that? I, I mentioned the verse and read it a little bit, and I said something about verses 8 through 19. It was always by faith. But see, when we look at what happened to Abraham and him being made righteous by God, it's before 
any circumcision, any time that that was required, any outward sign of being part of God's people. It was before he laid Isaac down. It was 400 plus years, the Bible tells us, before the law was even given. And yet, Father Abraham shows us something. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago about how to please the Lord. You and I know that oftentimes in studying the Bible, I think I may have mentioned this recently, that there's a lot of different ways to go. You can grab a word study, scripture, maybe a, a one, just one verse, and then you track that verse, and then you get the meaning of that verse. And, and then there's other things to study, the, the dispensations. The, you can just do a book study on just one book. And one of the places that I love to study is just character study, studying men and women of the Bible and what they're about. And Abraham's character, in his place, in his life, we know he had some times where he doubted. Yes, I mean, he even laughed a little. I don't know how much he laughed, but he probably sounds like he laughed a little bit, and his wife laughed a little bit, because they were going to have a child at such a young age, of course. But old Abe believed. If you look up on the screen, you'll remember that Genesis 15, 6 says, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it, the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. Righteousness, justification. Righteousness meaning very basically the doctrine... excuse me, concerning the way in which man may obtain a state of approval of God. Now think about that. I know that you hear that word righteousness and you hear justification and you're, okay, justice and it's righteousness and it's morality and it's being morally right and figuratively right. But it's the doctrine concerning the way in which and covering the way in which man may attain A state approved of God. Wow. I like to be in that place. And the neat part about it is I didn't have to do anything about it. Because Jesus Christ did the work that we put our faith and trust in. Now don't forget, this is way before the gospel is fulfilled. But the Bible teaches us that God preached the gospel to Abraham. If you write down the book of uh, Romans chapter number 4, excuse me, just the chapter, you'll realize there's so much in there. I've, I've highlighted verse number 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Remember, this is all about faith and righteousness. Chapter number 4 of Romans, Paul giving that heavy, strong doctrine of for by grace are you saved through faith. In that book of Romans, even in verse number four, it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I also put up on the screen, and again, you can do some study on Romans 4. By the way, how many of you, real quick, little quick poll, how many of you say Romans is your favorite book? Raise your hand. Two people, three people. Oh my gosh. I figured it'd be like half the audience. Well, make it your favorite. (laughs) Everybody online was going, yeah, it's my favorite. (laughs) At least I'd like to believe that. Romans 16 chapters are power packed with the necessary doctrine to be a healthy follower of Jesus Christ. If you're unhealthy in your faith, you're kind of wavering in your wonderment of what you ought to do, then you look up and you go, wait a minute. Wow, verse number 16, therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all seed. And it continues and it says this, not to that which, excuse me, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. You can't go wrong with that song. And anybody that was in our youth group centuries ago with the legendary Tim Templeton, he used to do it every Sunday. And any of you know Tim, only Tim, with flip-flops on and shorts could do it better than anybody, I'll tell you. But it's a reminder again, and even teaching little children, that Father Abraham scripturally is our father. He is the one that shows us that God imputes and puts upon us the righteousness. He was counted for righteousness because he believed by faith. 
It's the way in which we attain a state of approval, as I said earlier, that righteousness of God, the justice of God, or the virtue which gives each his due. Galatians is a companion book to Romans, as I've mentioned more than one time, and it shows us this, that as Romans focuses on the salvation by grace, Galatians focuses on the servanthood, the service unto the Lord by grace. And that's one of the big confusion places that Paul had to deal with when he withstood Peter. And Peter was saying, hey, after you're saved now, you need to attain God's favor. What? Yeah, yeah, you have to keep the law now. What? What, are we Judaizers? Yes. If you go back to Acts chapter number 15, you're reminded again about the Judaizers. Who are those Jews that get converted to Christianity but are bringing back the law into Christianity? And they're bringing all those law-abiding issues, those places of, hey, you need to get circumcised. If you're not, you're a Gentile believer. What? What? Why do I have to get that? Just to follow the law and you need to be like an Old Testament Jew. Wait a minute, you can't eat with the Gentiles anymore? No, you can't. But Peter did. You see, those are kind of easy ones, but tough ones in the time. And they're a reflection of what God's trying to teach us, which is that it's the liberty in Christ that we live in, in the grace and the goodness and the faith. It's not in us saying, well, yeah, I'm part of Father Abraham's family, sure. And I know it's by faith, so Father Abraham's family, that's who you are, believers. You're in Father Abraham's family. If you called on the name of the Lord to save you, you can remember a place in your life where you went from death to life, and you just passed from death to life. It wasn't some particular prayer that you said. There was something that happened inside. It was your heart being converted. By Almighty God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit of God comes, and he seals you to the day of redemption. So, Galatians chapter number 3, for that was a little bit of introduction. Look at verse number 6, and let's read it through. To, again, get the context, understand that, hey, we covered those first five verses uh, uh, two weeks ago, but now we're in verse number 6, and we're going to go down through verse number 14. Even as Abraham believed God, verse 6, and it was accounted him to him for righteousness, recalling again this scriptural evidence. This is the scriptural proof. This is the scriptural Old Testament into New Testament proof and argument of grace and faith. He says in verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the Gentile, the barbarian, the Greek through faith, he preached, I said it earlier, remember the Bible says, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Powerful statement when you go back and look in Genesis chapter number 15, 14, go all the way through that account, 16, 17, 18, you see the powerful statement of God speaking to Abraham. And later we'll see and be reminded that he was accounted and called the friend of God. Verse 9, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Do you like to be blessed? Do you like having a blessing? Do you like, I, I lo- don't, Dwayne loves to be blessed. I love that. Thank you. We have one person that loves to be blessed. I love being blessed. It starts with that place in your life. Now, I know the Bible says that the goodness of God leads to repentance. And so there's things that are coming into your life when you were lost. I remember all the times that God, God could have taken me off this earth so many times. But that was, to me now, I look back and go, wow, God had his hand of blessing upon my life. But it's so much more superior, so much more crazier to think that when we that believe on the Lord by faith... I can't see him. I don't know if he exists. This faith thing is tough. Well, yeah, it's faith. It's just like you having faith in the prescription that some doctor wrote that you can't even read. He hands it over to somebody, a pharmacist who you don't know, and they hand you stuff that you don't know anything about, and you look up on Google and go, what? And you start taking them by faith because you want to be better. Doc, you have pretty good handwriting. That little lefty slant like that, you know. That's why I stayed away from Doc. I didn't want any of those prescriptions. I didn't know what he was giving me. The blessing comes 
when that life starts brand new in Christ, which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham were in his family. For as many as are of the works of the law, verse 10, are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to them. The Bible teaches us that that law is a curse. It's a curse. Ah. But verse 11 comes to us and says this. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That tree is the tree that Jesus Christ hung on for you and for me. It's interesting that that terminology is used. We'll come back to that here in a little bit. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's a powerful statement right there. When you're born again, the God of the universe, as God promised, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, someone sent me a text the other day, he said, hey, Brownie, I know a lot of things. But I've told you I don't know everything. And one of the things I do not know is how God can be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And how he can be all three and that the Holy Spirit, he comes in. And that we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Am I saved or am I lost? God in you, you know if he's in you. Even in those places where you know that your faith walk is turned to a law-pleasing walk and you know you need to come back to living in that faith walk. But remember this, in this study in the book of Galatians, that Paul is reminding them with his incredible, incredible devotion. Hey, do you remember when we started this church, we planted this church by preaching Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And if you went back to chapter number one and chapter number two and you look and are reminded of all that we covered and then in the beginning of chapter number three and the fact that, hey, Galatians, you've been bewitched that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. How did you get to a place? Of course, he asked five questions, six questions in there and you say, wow, how did they get to a place where they were saved by grace through faith, and they're all, hey, they're new creatures in Christ. They have a church cranking up, and now they fell back into a place where they want to follow the law, and the law is the curse. Just a quick sidebar, think of this. If the law was sent by God and given to us by God, and we're going to see where the importance of it comes, because we do want to throw the, the law out. It says in the book of Romans, we're not throwing it out. But it's called a curse. It's God's curse. Cursed is everyone that continueth on in all things which are written. The law is a curse from God. Can you imagine how worse our laws as man and our rules are as man that we have concocted to have people believe that's how you walk to please God? Because if God brought the law and it's called a curse and it's God's curse, can you imagine man's laws and rules that we have? We have so many that get in the way of us following by faith. Let's remember our outline, then we'll come back and make a couple of points here in our outline. The first one is a reminder of last time. I mentioned it already in our introduction. Paul's personal argument for grace. That was his first argument. Again, first of six. He's making six arguments about how important grace is. And of course, how it leads then in to our place where we understand faith and grace and how closely they're tied together and how the faith message is contrary to the law message. And then, of course, the next section that we're going to come back to in a moment, this is Paul's scriptural argument 
for grace. He's saying, hey, I have an argument for grace here, and it's backed by Scripture from the beginning of time, from Moses writing what he wrote to now what Paul the Apostle is writing. The most powerful and convincing is this arguing on the basis of Scripture than for one's own experience. Hey, I experienced something. I, I felt something. I know something. That, that's good. But if it doesn't line up with Scripture and the truth of Scripture, then what good is that experience? Because it falls apart, because it has no basis in the Bible. It has no basis in God's promises. It has no basis in the structure and the principles and the truth of the Word of God. See, Paul is doing something. It says basically in his argument here that he changes and turns from the subjective to the objective because it's the evidence of God's Word that we're looking at. And then, of course, the third argument that we'll cover next week, so a quick preview, 10-second preview, Paul's logical argument for grace. Maybe many of you like logic. I like when things are logically explained. Well, we're going to get into that next week as Paul goes into this place of a logical argument for grace. So back to our section of verses 6 through 14, a little bit of doctrinal background. You see, we know that Paul knows the Bible. Paul knows the Old Testament. Paul knows all about the Old Covenant. Why? Because he was trained by the best. And he speaks of that a couple different times in Scripture. One of the best references, of course, would be in Philippians chapter number 3, where he speaks of the man he is as a Jew. And he talks about his, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was trained by a man named Gamaliel and that he was a scholarly man of the Old Testament. He says of himself he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means he was a lead person as a Pharisee. He knew the Old Testament. And so it behooves him to say, I'm going to lean on Scripture. I'm going to have a scriptural argument. Let me point out a couple of simple things here. As Paul is quoted, of course, Genesis chapter number 15, verse 6, and as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, we see that. We also see some other things. You see, belief in God's word and his incredible, simple, good news gospel is the way to salvation, as we know. And as I walk through some of the notes that I have, I, I'm reminded of this. We are made clean. Believers, we are made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as it says in verse number 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So, as many as received them, them gave me power to become the sons of God. And this is the record that God hath given eternal life, and that life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of God hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the scriptural argument from the Old Testament is, hey, it started out here with this Abraham guy having faith. In the way that Jesus is, Jesus is preached by God about the gospel, as it says there. But God is now saying, look, your faith, your belief is counted for righteousness. Why is that so important? Because here we are centuries later, and the same twisting is going on as it was back there. We need to do something about the law. Of course, Deuteronomy 27 is quoted here. And we see in verse and we see in verse number 10, we see there again and going a little bit further. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not, and all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You say, well, I'm going to follow the law. I, I'm going to just please God that way. Well, salvation could never come by obedience to the law because what does the law bring? It's a big C right there. A curse. Okay, so that throws that out. But how in the world is it that the legalist would say, you know what, I can still keep it when you're cursed attempting to keep all the law. You say, well, then we throw the law out? God forbid. I'll give you a little highlight into what we're going to come back to. Very simply, you know how you can obey the law? By being saved. Because the spirit of promise, verse number 14 tells me, that I now have the Holy Spirit in me to give me the ability to fulfill a command. To be obedient in the Spirit of God is what God's looking for because that's by faith. He doesn't want you to say on the external, hey, let me show a few of you how good of a Christian I am today. Let me fool you all really good because we're good at that. 
We all probably got a master's degree going on our doctorates on how we're going to externally please God, as so we think, and others, and we get caught up in the external. Now, the other side of that is this. I need to really let the Spirit of God grow me more by the Word of God. That's this whole thing that Paul's saying. Grow up in the Lord. Grow up in the Spirit of God. I've said it before. Look, five or ten minutes is not going to grow you over the next year if that's all you give God every day. Let me give you a perspective. I'm not holding a... uh, you know, an anvil or something over your head to drop it. This isn't, uh, um, what's his name, Roadrunner and uh, Wiley Coyote. Setting something up to get the Roadrunner, always trying to get him. That's not what I'm saying. That's not God. That, that's totally contrary. He's saying, I put something before you that you could have life and that you could have it more abundantly. I tell you that I speak different words. My words are words of life. I speak words that are different. I speak spirit, and I speak truth. I preach grace and truth, and I bring things that you're not used to seeing and hearing and knowing, and this world is not about speaking to you God's words. God's words are important. We had a conference a couple years about that. God's words and how he says them and the context of what he's saying and the doctrine of what he's saying and the sweet message. You can't get any better words ever written when you go back to those Old Testament prophets and read some of the things that they wrote. And their hearts pouring out to God. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the Psalms, they're pouring out their words from God. So it's the Spirit of God pouring them out. And when we read them and pray them through, we go, oh my gosh, God has something totally different in the way that he goes about life than I'm used to seeing and hearing. Exactly. We need more than five or ten minutes. I need more than ten minutes, half an hour, an hour, two hours. I've got to hear what God has to say. Because God speaks different than this world. You say, duh. Well, then why are we falling into the duh? Verse 11 tells me again, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Think about this. The legalist lives under a curse, and they're trying to find some way of making this really, really decent, low-level Like, get me by faith. Get me by faith does not do well. And again, when you see what he's saying in verse number 11, you're not justified by the law on the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. We'll come back to that one here in a little bit. Hey, look. A substandard or low-level faith, if that's what you're going to settle for, then eventually you'll end up just being a a person that has moral righteousness. You don't want to live like that. That may be one of the reasons why you don't like the way you're living. I know, I come from a personal place where I understand that. We all do, and followers of Christ, when we get to that place where our faith is just kind of low level, kind of, again, redeemed. You and I are redeemed. We're a purchased slave that's been set free. And then when you see in verse number 12, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Just be reminded, it takes absolutely no faith to live by the law. Think about that. It doesn't take a whole lot of faith. In fact, You're not even testing your faith by just doing exactly what the law says all the time in your flesh on the external. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The faith walk is a different walk. So we need to become more full of faith, not just faithless, got a low-level faith. You see, the legalist lives under a curse because he actually excludes faith in favor of choosing works. You say, well, what about that James thing of faith and work? Show me faith. Yeah. They're not mutually exclusive. They're tied together. And that's what Paul is saying in reference to Abraham. His actions, his words, his thoughts, his relationship with God the Father was counted as righteousness because he believed and he had faith. So when you think about Abraham's family, we are part of it. 
It's Abraham's family of faith. Abraham's family of faith. You say, what does that entail? How can you break that down, pastor, to make it practical? Well, let me give you four short little things that go through what we just did, maybe a little more doctrinal part, but now a little application part. The first one I want you to see as being in Abraham's family of faith is this. Do you see that your faith walk, your salvation is inherited, and it automatically trickles in, or is it imputed? You will say, of course it's imputed. That's what the Bible says. Well, how is it sometimes we get mixed up with our children? Meaning this. There are many religions out there that teach that if you just have babies and bring them to church, then you increase the church. Pam Snow was telling me that for the children's ministry. So we just need to have more babies. Well, obviously you complied and now we have children everywhere. But the salvation is not by inheritance genetically. Salvation is not genetic. And it cannot be passed on genetically. But surely it can spiritually. You see, it's harder work. And you know, we'd love to say that we don't live this way. Do as I say, don't do as I do. I was saying a sweet little testimony to ADP Sports over the 17, our 17th season there, so 16 years. Thank you all for being more about your actions and your expressions and your kind acts because that's telling people you have faith. And now you have an opportunity to open up your mouth and tell them where your faith is. And people will respond to that because it's not that you're able to genetically pass on your faith in Jesus Christ with people that you do not know. But I find myself wondering as the days go on that we think automatically our children are going to be okay because we're Christians. And how do I know that? Because I asked the teenagers. Right, Jay? Go ask some teenagers. You see, Paul's saying from Abraham and his scriptural stuff... It's imputed. It is as the word means to put into one's account. And at the time that this righteousness is imputed into you, also too, when that righteousness comes, it washes away the sin part. That's the redemption. So here's a couple of verses up on the screen. You can write the references and check them out later. I'm going back to Romans, Romans 4. Romans 4.24 says this. But for us, also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, we look at that and say, even if you're in that passage, you realize there's something more in the two verses before that that say, and therefore was imputed to him for righteousness. Paul writing about Abraham. And now it was written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. It wasn't just written for Abraham that that righteousness was imputed unto him and only him alone. It was but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. It also says in James chapter number 2, I referenced this earlier, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And he was called, this is an ad, and he was called the friend of God. That statement right there puts us in a place where we're reminded of what Jesus Christ said to the disciples. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So to me, the first choice of how you're going to show that you're in Abraham's family, the family of faith, is to say, I'm going to live in a place of having faith imputed excuse me, righteousness imputed on me, I'm not looking for me to be born again by some genetic inheritance. The second one I want you to see in being in the Abrahamic faith family is this. Is it conditional that you live after salvation or do you live by covenant? What is Paul saying here? He's saying, look, verse number nine, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. I mentioned that earlier. You see, a believer in Christ 
if they keep the law of God, they attempting to do it in their own flesh, it's not going to work. I mentioned this earlier. So let me just say it this way. A believer in Christ keeps the law of God because the Spirit of God empowers him to do so. Now just sit on that for a moment. The believer in Christ, the one who's in the family of faith of Abraham, is part of the covenant. They're not conditioned or looking for a conditional way of living with the Lord. They're in Abraham's family of faith, and they're saying, hey, I keep the law of God because the Spirit of God empowers me to do so. Anytime you and I attempt to do it the other way, if we would be perfectly transparent about it and go back into the Word of God, we see how we come up and fall. We fail. The covenant of God is by grace through faith. Oftentimes, a legalist figures this, that by obeying the, law, obeying the rules of the church, and the pastor, without really believing a word that he says or a word that he's teaching from the Bible, that's going to be okay with me. But all it does is, for that person that thinks that way, it leads to an empty faith. And now it's back to having a conditional faith walk. Well, I wonder if God was happy with me today. I wonder if God was, I, I probably did bad there. I don't know if I did good there. I don't know if I did bad there. Whoa. You're going to drive yourself crazy. And that's what Paul's telling the churches of Galatia. Get your faith to a place where it's growing each and every day. Another day, another couple days. Stay with it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And then you're going to say, I live by covenant righteousness. I am in the family of God, the Abrahamic family. He is my father, just as it lines up with I am in the father's family as a child of God. And I'm not walking like it's all about my obedience to the law being external, but rather it ought to be internal. My obedience to the law is not external, but it is internal. So what have I got up on the screen? A couple of references you can write down. Galatians 3.17, it's right there on your lap. We'll cover this next week. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. The law cannot disannul the covenant that God made before Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ came to the earth, but it's, it's Jesus Christ preeminent before he even came to the earth. That's why it says that God preached before the gospel unto Abraham. It says also in Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. What does that? The blood of the everlasting covenant. Do you live in a covenant walk or do you live in a conditional walk? It's working in you. That which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's the covenant faith walk of us being in Abraham's family of faith. Not the conditional walk. Well, I... You're free to walk by faith. But on the other side of faith, sometimes there's fear. So here's the third one. Fear or faith. Now I'm going to read that right off the bat. Acceptance is not found by living in fear of failure. I failed God, stop loving me. We feel that sometimes. It's just in our human nature. But in the nature of God in us by the Holy Spirit, it's not a place of I wonder if God's going to love me and I end up developing a fear in my flesh. The spiritual fear that we ought to have is a real fear of God, which is honor, respect, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you would like to have some wisdom, then you ought to recognize who's the one that's got it all. That's called a fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, when the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing in Proverbs. 
Do I want wisdom? Yes, I do. I would rather live that way than live in the fear side of wondering if God's ever going to give me anything or ever be pleased with anything that I've ever done. See, the legalist binds himself under bondage of the fear of failure. And that curse is too hard to bear. You tracking? Paul's trying to tell him, you're not, free, you're not free to just do whatever you want. You're free and redeemed as a bought slave to be able to say, hey, I'm justified. I have righteousness. I don't have to be in a place of living by the fear of failure. When I fail, I say, Lord, I know you've already forgiven me. So I confess that I make it right and tell you, I admit that mess. I've been wandering down the wrong side of the road. See, those who cannot accept the grace of God in their daily life beyond the grace of their salvation, they're doomed to live a self-righteous life. It says in Habakkuk chapter number two, verse number four, watch this real quick. You can study it later. There's a reason why God's word says what it says all the time, every jot and tittle. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now what does it say in Galatians 2.20? Or, as I've got up on the screen there, I've got a different verse, Galatians 3.11. But that no man is justified by the, by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, right? It's right there in our text, the just shall live by faith. Whose faith? Back to verse number 20 of chapter number 2. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God is a lot different than his faith in Habakkuk chapter number 2 and my faith in Mark chapter 0. That's the way it is. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, as it says in Romans 1.17. You see, the scriptures are clear for you and me. It is not by my faith. It says in verse number 12, and it's up on the screen, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. If you do that law, you live in them. When you're born again, you can live like that in a free way and go, I just love serving God. I love doing what God wants me to do. If you have any children, if you've ever raised any children, it's the greatest thing in the world to see them do what you ask them to do just because they love you. It's a beautiful thing. And it's great to be a grandparent because you don't care what they do because everything they do is right. <laughs> That's a contradiction to this right here, so we'll take that out. Last one as we finish up. Now, this is where verses number 13 and 14, you wonder if I was going to get there. They're very important for the next two minutes. I want you just to hang in here. It's very important. Father Abraham's family of faith. I've talked to Bobby, Dwayne, Brian, different people over the years, some of you even. People that are born again, new creatures in Christ, saved, step back, fallen back, stopped walking by faith. A week went by, a month went by, a year went by, and they were just, just weren't living for the Lord. And so where did they get? They got to a place where they believed that rejection happened to them, that they lost their salvation, that somehow God's favor is never going to return and they never, ever are going to go to heaven. They believed that somehow, some way, that some Bible teaching somewhere got mixed with their own righteousness and their failure to follow the Lord, and, is, and they lived by the fear of failure. And then rejection entered in. In their minds and thoughts, they thought, God's rejected me. So, Father Abraham, family members, do you live in rejection or do you live in redemption? Because when you live in rejection, you're reminded of this. Blessing comes through the finished work on the cross. There's blessings in your life. See them all. They're so beautiful and they've come from the Lord. 
for you to breathe right now and to be sitting there is a blessing from God. It says right here in the Bible in verse 13 and 14, it came from the finished work on the cross by Jesus Christ. When he said, as Bobby taught on Wednesday, and I think he was screaming a little, it is finished. It's done. So when you believe in the one that said it's finished, you now have that redemption sitting right there. You don't have to go find some new sacrifice to put on the altar for God because David himself, King David said, what? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Thou will not despise. See, blessing comes through the finished work on the cross. Redemption is a releasing affected by the payment of a ransom. He paid the ransom. There's no curse in all that because he took care of the curse. So when it says in verse number 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. You couldn't hang on that tree. You couldn't pay your own price. You could not shed the blood because your, your blood is filled with sin. His was perfect. And that happens so that verse 14 comes in and says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I'm not so sure you guys are really getting what you've got. You really may not be. You say, well, I've been saved for 30, 40 years. You ought to maybe wake up about that. See, Paul references the tree, and it relates to the cross in which Jesus died. Acts chapter number five, 1 Peter chapter number two. <laughs> he was not stoned like they used to do to a criminal. His body then exposed and just laid there in the center square. He was nailed alive to a tree and left there to die. The finished work on the cross. So when it says in Ephesians chapter one, verse number 13, a verse that you hold on to about your salvation, about your the Holy Spirit of God sealing you, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Paul's writing that to the believers in Ephesus, in whom also, this is for you and me. After that, ye believed, I believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's the promise. So you are taken care of. You are redeemed. You don't have to live in a place of rejection. Even if you've made a mess out of your life, but you're born again, and you are a child of God, and you belong to Abraham's family of faith. Come on back. But you're going to have to bow your heart and bow your knee and say, be merciful to me, God. I was a mess. I made a mess out of me. I know that you've already forgiven me, but I say, I see in the Bible, I remember if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God, I remember when I got saved. Woo, thank you for saving me. That happened 10, 15 years ago. And now, huh, if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And now I'm in a place like this, as it says up in the screen, and I was reading earlier in Galatians. And it says, verse number 13, up on the screen, one more time. As we finish out, I want you to really, really see this. Look up on the screen, look in your Bibles. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Stop going after the law in the wrong way. Go after the law as a redeemed, born-again child of God who just absolutely loves to do that which God would have you to do because you love pleasing him by faith. Going all the way back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. Because it's impossible to please him without faith. So operate in the place of faith. And guess what will happen? You will go, ha, you know what? Psh, I don't have to worry about the law because I love obeying and walking and serving God because it's a faith. And people are going, well, you're just always just doing what's right. And I would say if they ever saw that in my life, thanks be to God for what he's done to me and in me to continue to mold and shape me to be like his son, Jesus Christ, because He's not done with the work in me, but he's done with the work that he has done. It's all in place. The word of God, the spirit of God are in place for more that you would have when it comes to verse number 14. I love that statement about this blessing, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. You don't need anything else than that. You're free now to live in Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. So let me just ans ask you this question as we have our invitation. From the curse to the cross, 
is your redemption by Jesus enough? It ought to be. Is your redemption by Jesus enough as God's family member? Why don't you bow your heads and, and let's pray. And uh, I'm just going to pray for you and then just let the music play for a couple of minutes and you can spend some time in prayer. You can come up here. If you feel like, hey, I can't make it out, then you can pray right where you are. It's a matter of your heart, not a matter of you having to make some fleshly moment or fleshly movement. It's an internal thing, isn't it? Not an external thing. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, the author and finisher. Thank you for by grace are you saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank you that, Jesus, you hung on the tree. Cursed is the law. And you fulfilled it all when you took your last breath and your blood was shed and the propitiation, oh, it was imputed upon my soul and upon all my brothers and sisters in the Abrahamic faith. I pray in this invitation time that you just grab a handle on our hearts and that we could answer this question. Jesus, is your redemption enough to free me to live my life by faith in Jesus' name? Please.